episode of Power Move Makers. This series was created with a simple goal in mind, to bring to the table high-level executives, successful entrepreneurs, and just all around inspiring human beings. Not just focusing on their successes, but more important, shining the spotlight on the road they travel to get there. Now this week's guest, if you've ever turned on a radio, if you've ever gone to the club, or if you just ever just turned up, there's no way that you can't know this man's voice or his name. Two-time Grammy Award winner, he has traveled the globe six or seven times. He has been a dominant force in the music industry for over 20 years. Please welcome to this week's show, Mr. Fat Man Scoop. Scoop, what up? What's going on, bro? What's going on? That's a that's a hell of an introduction, man. Um, yeah, man, I done I done I done lapped the world at least five hundred times. Like, you know, the the the, the So I forgot the, I, I forgot a few zeros. Oh yeah, definitely. I, if if you just talk about like maybe a weekend or four days doing the 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 circumference of the globe, I, I've done that at least a hundred times with a, with a you know like um going to Australia for Thanksgiving, going to do something and flying back, and like that that right there is the circumference of the Earth. Uh, and I've done that at least a hundred times, man. I, I I done put a lot of a lot of miles into this to this game, man. Yes, you have. Yes, you have. For you know, I, I would have asked you this later in the conversation, but just because we're on the subject, what's your favorite place? Italy, hands down. Why? Italy, because I'm 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 Italian inside, so I love Italian food. I love the language. I love the the sense of calm when I'm in Italy. Uh, some of my fav- favorite places in Italy are the, the Amalfi Coast. Um, one of my favorite places in Italy is, of course, Venice. Venice, Venice, and Amalfi Coast are tied for number one. And then you know you you hop into Rome or you you hop into some of those little towns in Italy that are just like nook and cranny towns. Always beautiful, man. Like. That's my favorite place. My favorite place to to go and do clubs would have would, would actually have to be China. China has some of the China has the best or some of the best clubs in the entire world to me. Wow, that's a big statement because you've been everywhere, performing right. on stages everywhere. So to sing yeah. about China as having one of the the most robust and live club scenes in the world. That's saying a lot, school. Definitely, man. Like, when you go to China, man, <laughs> their whole thing is about making you feel like you're a superstar, even if you're not. You know, they, they're guys that go there and don't have a huge following, and, you know, they treat them incredibly well. I mean, one time I was there, and I mean, I have a... A, a, a robust following in China. But one time I was there and, you know, they, they make these placards and shit with your face on it and, you know, whatever. And, and you know, they had Batman scoop signs. And, you know, I had to, you know, my, my signature on my um, passport. They didn't know what it was. They had no idea that it didn't say Batman scoop. So fucking Isaac Freeman. But they took that shit and they put it on a, on a, on a thing, and they were waving that shit. I said, oh, yeah, I love Isaac Freeman, too. Okay, well, fuck it. Um, you so, know, hold they, on, they, they waving your government name? Yeah, they had my government signature because they thought it was Fat Man School. So they had <laughs> taken my government signature and made a pla- a big-ass placket out of it. You know how y'all used to do back in the days with Puff, the big styrofoam? styrofoam yeah, yeah, yeah. Like um, and, and, they, and they took that, and they made it, they did that thing, and it was fucking amazing. Um, and, and just... just the level of, of how they do it. Listen, it's nothing for you to go to, to, to China and for them to have your name upside down. So, you know, Fat Man Scoop is supposed to be this way, but they'll have the shit upside down, <laughs> right? But the energy that they doing it with, you can tell they fucking care. Okay, they didn't, they didn't know how to read it, but it, just the level of energy, man, and the way they do things, I, my personal opinion is China has the best clubs in the world for me. And, and I've been to Vegas, and I've been to LA, and I've been to New York, and I've been everywhere that you can think of, and I still, I still put China as number one. 
I mean, I would have never guessed that. And it's such a, a, an amazing revelation, I guess, you know, because you've been just so many places. I'm thinking you're going to say something like San Tropez. You're going to say the South of France, somewhere in the UK, because they got a crazy scene. Go ahead. Go ahead. Bro, VIP club in, in San Tropez, VIP club in, in the, in, uh, on the Champs de Elysee. Like those places are, you know, those, those are places that are dope. Uh, one of my favorite clubs is Cavalli Club in, 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 in Dubai. Like we talk about, but I'm talking about just, you know, those the are like my top madness. 10. Huh? The overall madness? Just, just the yeah. whole feel? Yeah. Overall madness, jumping, acting crazy, going berserk. They don't even understand the words, but it's just the, the energy that they go with. The shit is crazy, man. So so for me, that's where I feel like, you know, shit, that's where it is. So for me, I'd say China and uh, for, for clubs and, you know, of course, like, you know, our central pay VIP room and, you know, places like that. And, um, you know, for me, where I, where I would, as far as where I feel the best as a person, as a human being, I would say it would be, like we said, it would be um, Italy and, 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 and Alaska is number one. Excuse me? Alaska, Alaska and Iceland are number one with me. Number but one? What? To, wait, like if I, here's the thing. Where you got, where you would want a summer house, I don't want a summer house. I want a winter house. I lose weight in the winter to wear winter clothes. I don't care about the fucking summer. I, I love rain. I love cold. I love snow. For me, for me, when it's 40 below, when, you, when it's time to pull on 40 belows and beef and broccoli, Timberlands, that's my shit. When it's time to put on the North Face, put on the Marmot, put on the fucking, I don't like, I don't even like the fucking uh, Mark Claire's because they too, they too tight. I like big fucking, you know, just rugged shit. So that, you know, for me, the winter is the time. This is my time that okay, we're coming so, into. So living in New York, you not mad at New York weather because <laughs> I always say about New York, it's just too extreme. And I'm born and raised in New York. But the what you know, we got the hottest summers. Hot, hot ass summers, man. I mean, it's 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 hot, boiling hot in the summer. In the winters, it's like Game of Thrones. It's it's like it's the cold. It the chill is so crazy in this city. But most people are trying to get away from the cold. So it's interesting that you said, Nah, Sean, I would go to Iceland or I go to Alaska. Because I love the cold. That's where you know I feel most comfortable at. I, I tell you, I tell you this: like I live my life from March to, to just to get to September. That shit in the middle, Memorial Day and all that shit, I could do without it. Unless it's raining. If it's raining really, really hard, I'll rock with that. But you know, the sunny days and the ninety degree, I, I don't care about that shit. I, I want the rugged weather. Like for me. You know, I've been, you know, and now since the pandemic, I'm starting to create businesses. And of course it's hard, you know, you got to work on it. But my goal is to, in the next year or two, in, in, after the second week or third week of December, the second week of December, I see y'all later, be safe. I'll check y'all in March. And I'm just going to go to Alaska or go to Maine, somewhere probably Maine or something or Vermont, like on the East Coast, where, because you know, if you go to Alaska, you're, you're, you're going back five hours in time. So it's really hard to do your business. But if I could get like something in Maine, Vermont, I've even heard Erie, Pennsylvania, I want the fucking Lake Effect snow. I, I, I want the real shit, bro. When we were okay, growing up on, in the 70s. Get too sidetrack. Before we get too sidetracked. In the 70s and 80s, friends, we had real snow. This shit that we have now ain't real snow. But look, let's go forward, bro. Yeah, because I've been talking to you about that shit all day. That's my peaceful place. That snow and you know, my dream is to have a chalet in Switzerland where I, we're snowing or, or you know, uh, whistling Canada or whatever. Like that's my shit. Got you. Okay, let's bring it back because I wanna I wanna take a walk 
down, you know, the, the story of your life, because I think you're very inspirational to a lot of people. Like I said at the top um, of this interview, there's no way that you can be a fan of hip hop, you can be a fan of music in general, or be a person who has experienced the clubs for the last 20 years that don't know the significance of Fat Man Scoop. Scoop, I never asked you this. Where'd you get that name from? Where, where, where is Fat Man? Well, Fat Man, I'm assuming, because you're, you're, you're heavy set, you're overweight. So that, that seems to be obvious. Where'd the Scoop come from? The Scoop came from my Uncle Jack. So my real name is Isaac Freeman III. I never liked that name. I never, I never, I never, to this day, I'm, you know, I'm, you, I'm now comfortable with saying my name, but I hated Isaac Freeman III. Like, I hated that shit. <laughs> I realized maybe about 10 years ago that that's the money right there. I didn't realize that, you know, my mother didn't name me to Quanisha, Jordanisha, whatever. Isaac Freeman III sounded like somebody got some money. <laughs> And, and, and listen, if I break it down to I Freeman the third, like like H Ross Perot, it really sounds like I got three hundred billion after taxes. So <laughs> and, anyway, I didn't like my name uh, when I was one. When I was young, this this is like eight months, nine months. They used to try to feed me food. You know, you know the baby food and stuff, yep. and they kept telling me I didn't want it. But when it came with the ice cream, I would always eat it. So my Uncle Jack, you know, he would have to take me to the ice cream store, you know, because I wouldn't eat nothing else. And one day he just started calling me school, and it stuck. Nobody called me Isaac. Nobody called my teachers, my friends, my mother, my father, family members. Nobody ever called me uh, Isaac. Like, my teachers in school used to be at your school. What's the, what's the answer to this? Okay, it's seven. Are you serious? Yeah, most of my teachers. There was some that called me Isaac, and I, I, I was in a I was in a zone where I, I didn't like it so much. If you call me Isaac, I didn't answer. To all my movers, if you love educational and inspirational content just like this, please like comment and subscribe to this channel but most important if you know anybody making power moves just like you share it now back to the video let, let me ask you this you're from the bronx correct just like me no no, no i'm i'm here's the story i'm from harlem originally from harlem i'm from harlem i'm a harlem guy i, I grew up in uh, schaumburg projects where, where, the, uh, where the exonerated five are from the central park five though those guys were like the little kids in my neighborhood, they were like seven, eight years younger than us. We used to always say, Yo, keep, stay the fuck out of the park. Like, you know, that's that's my neighborhood, Schaumburg. And um, my thing was that when I got married, my first marriage, I wound up, my, 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 my first wife lived in the Bronx. And, um, you know, I had to move up there for her. And, you know, I, never, I didn't have an apartment. I didn't have anything. I was just coming right out of my mother's house. So, I, you know, she actually had, and, and, and like 21, she had her shit together. She had a crib, everything. She was doing her thing. So um, I got up there and, I, you know, we got together and, you know, we, you know, she was pregnant. And the next thing you know, and, you know, then we had, you know, we had a kid. And, you know, I used to work at a place called Mount Sinai Hospital. And I bust my butt, bust my butt, bust my butt. And I wound up getting an apartment in Co-op City. So that's why everybody thinks that I'm from the Bronx because most people who know me during those Mount Sinai years and Tommy Boy years know me for living in Co-op City. Exactly. So I, th I, I thought you was actually from the BX and Co-op. Scoop, walk us through, how did you transition into the music industry? Okay. The, you know, the story with that is, is, is long, but I'm going to try to give you the short way. I started out as a rapper. I was under the tutelage of Dougie Fresh. So I was a direct disciple of Dougie Fresh. Um, really, my mentor, my day-to-day -day mentor, the person who, who I, I attribute everything that I've ever done to, if, it was not, if he wasn't in the picture, I would not be who I am, is DJ Chilwell from the Get Fresh Crew. Okay. So that's like my mentor, my brother, you know, he taught us everything. He took us to places, you know, places we even have no fucking business being. Club Zanzibar being 17 years old. The fuck you doing at Club Zanzibar in, in Newark, New Jersey? That shit was a fucking jungle. But, you know, we would go with them to do shows and stuff like that. So they would give us the inspiration of this is what you can be 
if you put your work in. And then, you know, Will was a DJ, so he did a lot of the production for the Get Fresh crew. And I had two DJs down with me. One was named Steve D. He was the uh, New Music Seminar World Champion. Another one was named Sean C. And Steve D, Sean C, and the other couple bunch of DJs that we used to hang, hang with every day, our collective, created a crew called the X-Men, who became the Execution. But Steve D and Sean C were my DJs. And it, it, in, in our farm system, two people that were in our farm system that you would know directly was myself and Rob Bass. So Rob Bass, DJ Easy Rock, who we call Skip, God Bless the Dead, DJ Easy Kid, who we call Two, uh, Two that's still moving around out here, and myself and my crew, we were all part of this little collective. And uh, we used to we used to, you know, do shows at, club, at places called 201, IS 201, with uh, these uh, promoters named Mike and Dave. Now, back then, this is in the 80s. This is like 84, 85, 86. I'm a young kid. I'm, I'm like in eighth grade, you know what I'm saying? And, and uh, I'm, 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 in, I'm in ninth to tenth grade, right? And, you know, we would do these jams and, and parties and stuff. And, and people, if you don't know who Mike and Dave are, they were like some of the first hip hop promoters that existed in the five boroughs. You know, there were people in Brooklyn, uh, Mike and Dave were in the Bronx and Queens and, and, and Harlem, because they were from Harlem. Mike and Dave were a part of a group called the Crash Crew. Okay, Crash, and go Google Crash Crew if you don't know who Crash Crew is. However, um, they gave us the opportunity to come and hold our craft, and we used to, you know, open up for people like Dougie and, you know, Positive K and whoever would come to perform at these shows. Now, this was like, there was no Live Nation. There was no Al Heyman, Budweiser Superfest. This was like the real Chitlin circuit. Um, and from there, um, I got a, I, I, I used to hang out in St. Nick Projects in Harlem. And we used to hang out in front of this place called Salem Church. Salem Church is right on the corner of 129th Street and 7th Avenue. And that used to, because we had friends over there and that was our area. There was a building right next to, to uh, Salem, a building called 225. And in 225, there was somebody on the first floor. And all you would hear is fucking music coming out of their window. I mean, all the time, like, you know, just beats. Not, not songs, just fucking beats. And we used to be attracted to that shit. We would hang out over there near that place where, you know, because, you know, on the projects, you got the first floor and, you, you know, you got like, you got the, 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 the uh, metal, the metal fence and shit like that. Yeah. And we used to hang over there and shit like that and just listen to the beats. Because it was the music. We, we, we were fucking with that because we were all rappers and DJs and shit like that. That person that was in that that room in that in his apartment making music happened to be happened to be Teddy Riley. Okay, this is where so, the story gets real interesting. Yeah, so here, so here we go, right? So Teddy, so that's boom, Teddy Riley, whatever. Teddy Riley had a brother named Markel. Uh, you know Rex and Effect. Mar uh, Markel is a Rex and Effect. Right? It's Markel, Akil, and Brandon. God bless the dead. Um, Markel, Brandon was a good friend of ours, and we knew Markel from gambling. Markel was the best CeeLo player I've ever met in my life. That motherfucker take, he'll, he'll break you. I mean, that motherfucker was breaking motherfuckers, like, hard. And he, I lost many a dollar fucking with Markel. I won some, but I lost more than I ever did. So Markel was friends with us from gambling, and he knew that we used to rap. He said, yo, y'all are dope. Let me get your tape. And he went and gave his tape to his brother, Teddy. Teddy heard the tape. He was like, who are, they, who are these guys? Next thing you know, we were downtown, right across the street from the from the Universal Building on 57, where we got signed to GR Productions. Um, at that time, I was a young kid in the business, but I always knew about paperwork and getting a lawyer and all that kind of shit. So it took us a long time to get signed um, because you know I wanted to do the paperwork right and shit like that. During that time, um, Guy was there. Uh, Redhead Kingpin was there. Redhead Kingpin was like one of my good friends. Redhead Kingpin, Squeak, Bo Rock, all these dudes from Redhead's crew. Uh, DJ Wildstyle. Um, uh, 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 today, today, Big Bob and today, those are my guys. Like they were all, all around. And um, a guy named Xander Man, 
And of course, Guy, you know, of course, Guy, Aaron Hall, Damian Hall, of course, Teddy. And we got, we signed to them and we were signed to Virgin Records. And we went to start making our album. Make our album, long story short, there were a couple of things that happened. Uh, my man, Sean C., who you might you might know now, Sean C., just, he has an album out with Black Thought called uh, Cain and Abel. It's out right now. So um, he, he's a producer and Sean C. was, a and R for um, Loud Records, big pun. Uh, 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 fucking yep. very familiar with Sean C. Big pun, fucking. Uh, I'm just giving it to the people. Uh, 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 Wu Tang, he did Mob Deep, did everybody over. A lot of people over there. Um, he got into an altercation with 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 um, Teddy. They had some words over music. No, no fighting, but just over music. And listen, Teddy was the hottest motherfucker in the world. He, he was doing Michael Jackson selling fucking 330, 50 million records. Shit, it was unheard of. So um, during that time, uh, that happened. And right as that happened, Gene Griffin and Teddy broke apart. So Teddy let us out of our contract. So now we have no contract. I'm, 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 I'm set 18 years old. I don't know what the fuck I'm going to do. Chill Will, my mentor again, takes me to Puff. Takes me to Puff Daddy. So we go to Puff Daddy, and Puff Daddy says, yo, I fucking love this shit. Yo, this shit is hot, man. This shit is crazy. All right, here's what we're going to do, bro. We're going to put you, first we're going to let you do the hard shit that you do for the streets. Then we're going to put you in a suit and tie, and we're going to make you for the women. You're going to be the fat nigga that women love. Who's that? Heavy D. Who's the next person? Remember, he's 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 on Uptown now. This is this is right before he gets fired from Bad Boy. Who does that person become? Who Puff? No, no, that person he wanted me to be with. Okay. Big. Notorious B.I.G. No, he had that idea. Puff had that idea. He he had it down pat. He told everything. I'm gonna put you in the flyer shit. First, I'm gonna let you wear the hood and do the street shit. Then I'm gonna put you. With the clothes and everything, we're gonna make you a fly nigga. Like, we're gonna make you crazy fly, and you're gonna have the, the street niggas, and you're gonna have the, the R&B people. Anyway, um, you know, Puff gave us paperwork, and at that time, you know, he used to call my house like a lot, man. Like, God bless the dead. My father, oh, you know, when Puff became Puff, Puff, my father used to say, Yeah, I remember when Puff used to call my house and talk to me. All right, Dad, come on. Um, eventually I came to a conclusion, Sean, I said to myself, I'm rapping these hard raps, but I'm dancing like Dougie Fresh. I'm, I'm a happy guy, you know, because I learned the dancing and the performance through Doug and I wasn't no tough dude. I was fucking making music. Of course, we all know killers and all that shit from the neighborhood and we, we got people, but I was like, yo. I'm rapping all the street shit, but I'm not about this shit. Mm -hmm. And I had to sit down and I said, if I do this, I had the, I had the fucking uh, wherewithal to understand that if I do this shit, these motherfuckers are going to test me on this. I knew that I was going to go to Kansas and street niggas in Kansas was going to have a problem with me. I knew I was going to go to Texas. So I wasn't even, I wasn't even thinking about that. I, I was thinking about Harlem niggas, New York niggas, the niggas I know, wolves, all of that shit. I knew they was going to be on my back because they don't know, they know I'm not about that life. You, you understand where I'm coming from? Listen, you fuck with my daughter, you fuck with my son, I'll kill you. i kill you. Because that's my life. I don't have nothing else to live for. But I'm not no tough nigga. I'm not handling keys of coke or selling apes. I'm not doing none of that shit. And I started to say, well, who am I really? And the music that I loved was James Brown and, and Otis Redding and all that shit. So I made my own kind of style and we became a group called Three With Soul. I went back to Puff with that demo. That Three With Soul is sounding like De La Soul and shit like that. I go back to him. He takes the fucking tape. He, put, he puts it in the fucking cassette player and we play him and the shit. I'm like, yeah, this is the shit I'm about right what the fuck is this? <laughs> fuck this, right? But you know Puff, when Puff get crazy and extra, he fucking takes the, 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 the fucking tape out, he throws that shit across the town. I don't want this shit. 
<laughs> and I just, I, I just, I just, I, it's Puff. Like Puff was, he was Puff Daddy back then. He, he was, he was, you know, he was still at Uptown. He was, he was, you know, no, actually, I think he was right at Bad Boy. It was like right at the start of Bad Boy. And he, and he, you know, he was on that rocks. And um, I just said, you know, all right. And then I, I fucking said, fuck that. I went and worked at a, a job called, I, w- I went and worked at Mount Sinai Hospital. And I worked in a, in the laundry department. If you oh, know, the laundry oh, department. I, want, I, want, I want you, I want to touch, touch on a point before we move further in your story, if you don't mind. Because I try to extract as many gems and many things that can help somebody who's on their journey from your wisdom. And one of the things that you said was, it, you're making this music, and at the time, for anybody who doesn't know what Puff meant to the industry at that time, Woo! he I mean, th- th- this guy was, he was not as big as he would become, but he was the hot, he, he was the hot young a and He was the hot young exec. He was the guy you wanted to get down with. Puff was the fucking man in New York. And anybody in the music business, if you woke up in the morning, you wanted to be like Puff, period. Period. And, and that's, that, that's factual. So you have Sean Combs, Puff Daddy at the time, wanting to sign you and your crew. And you have this realization this, this awareness that I'm being signed under false pretenses. Yeah, it's fake. And I think for anybody who's listening, to become successful, it's one thing to know who you are and what you want, but truly to become successful, you have to know who you're not. Yeah and who you don't want to become. And I love that at 18 years old or so, you had this big opportunity. Most people would have taken it. Most people would have been like, I just got to get in. I know what Puff can do. I know what Uptown, I know what Bad Boy can do for my life. I'm going to take this opportunity. But the fact that you stayed true to who Isaac Freeman was at heart, I, I, I got to commend you on that. And I really want people to listen to that point because out mm-hmm. of that story, I think that that is one of the greatest gems, one of the greatest gifts that you can give our audience is sometimes, you know, some money costs too much. It, it ain't worth going out there and pretending to be something that you're not on any level. You were in the music. You, you, you're coming with these hard lyrics. But like you said, what's going to happen when I go to Kansas City? What's going to happen when I go to Texas and they start testing me? It, 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 that money costs too much. So whatever it is you're doing, I would, I, would, I would ask of you, please be very true to who you are. Be very true to your purpose because it might delay your, your success. But when your success comes... It's going to come. It's, it, it, will, it will absolutely come but it will be true and you will be able to have a longevity just like you have had mm-hmm. Had you've been slinging guns and talking about all the weight you moved. Maybe you would have got a hit, but you would have been out of here 20 something years ago. Yeah, but it's even bigger than that. So I look at it and I look back and listen, I, I loved big. I thought, yeah, you worked with big. I mean, shit, you worked hand in hand with big. Like, I could have been Biggie. Correct. I would have been in the middle of some shit with Suge Knight and them that I'm not, I'm not, not I'm not built for that. You're not built for it. Uh, you know, I, I would have been in this shit, some shit with legitimate gang members and shit like that that I wasn't built for. Um, again, I'll make it clear. If you touch my daughter, I'll kill you. Period. Because I have nothing to live for now. If you do something to my son, I will kill you because I have nothing to do. I have no life now. But I'm not a dude that's just gonna get out there and make my gun warm and shit like that. It's not, that's not my thing. You know what I'm saying? It's not my thing. Um, the thing that I understood was early was I have to be myself. And this ain't me. I never wore jewelry. Even at the years of Hot 97 where everybody was wearing jewelry and I never wore jewelry. Listen, I, I always knew that my face was my jewelry. 
Yep. I always understood I'm on camera, I'm on videos, I'm I'm on BET, I don't need no fucking jewelry. My face is my jewelry. I don't need that shit. So, you know, I decide not to take that route. Now, as fate would have it, and God would have it, he was preparing me for something else that I didn't even know that was gonna make me three times as strong. Matter of fact, not even three. It was gonna make me 40 times as strong as if I would have took that deal. So now, huh, so now I get kicked out of Puff's office. I'm sitting around like, what the fuck do I do? I go work in Mount Sinai Hospital. I work in, in, a, um, in the laundry department. If you don't know what the laundry department is, any piece of laundry that is used in the hospital goes down the chute. You know, you're on the, you're on the fifth floor in the cancer ward, somebody bleeds and throw the shit down the chute because you got to wash it. It all comes down into a big room. And my job was to go in that room and pick it up. So that's pissy, bloody, shitty, mucus, throw up, anything you can think of, the worst shit, right? And I and you have to put on a pair of goggles if you want it. And you have gloves and shit like that. Now, sometimes by mistake, a nurse don't give a fuck. They throw syringes down there, fucking uh, scalpels from OR, anything. You got to be careful with that shit, right? <laughs> But I need to I need to walk you through this to understand. I had a I had a um I had a a, a um a um supervisor. He used to push us. His name was Eddie. He used to push us like I want more bins. I want this shit is hard work bending up and down anyway. Fucking your back up. He wanted I want more. I want more. I want more. And I started getting written up. I was getting written up like every other week. And I said to myself, this is not going to work, man. I got a kid on the way, man. I can't do this, man. I'm like, I can't, I can't be here. My, I can't do this. This is not going to be the thing that's going to, my kid, man. Like, what the fuck am I going to do? So what do I do? I go to the person that I know in the business. I go back to Puff Dad. And I say, hey, Puff, man. I walk in the up to Bad Boy Records at the time. I, I go to Puff and I'm like, yo, Puff. Um... What do I do, man? I, I, I want to be in the music business. So Puff, probably thinking that he could convince me to go back to the shit that I was doing, he said, yo, come here and do record promotion. I was like, what's record promotion? He's like, oh, that's when you talk to all the radio DJs across the country. He said, you mad funny, you this, 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 come and do this shit. And, and, and you know, you can work in radio. So I right, cool. That was a Friday evening. I went back home and I called my only friend in the business at that time, real friend, Joe Kirkland. His name is Diamond D. From Diamond D and the Psychotic Neurotics, yeah. uh, producer, digging in the crew, uh, digging in the crew. Crew. all that shit. Because I went to school with him. We used to rap on the tables and everything. So I said, yo, yo, Joe, I'm trying to be in the music industry, bro. Can, can you help me? And Joe said, yeah, I got you, bro. Um, what do you want to do? I said, I don't know what the fuck to do. You know, Puff told me record promotion. He said, well, I'm going to give you the guy's name, call him, and go to Abby. So I call him on Monday, and he says, well, if Joe said you're good, you're good. Come down here. So I worked from 7 to 3 at Mount Sinai Hospital, and I, I took the, my lunch break off, and I got off the 2. I took a shower, and I went down to... to um, uh, the time chemistry. No, chemistry. This okay. was L.O.G. and the Bulldogs, Poison yep. Pots, all yep. that. Chemistry records. Yeah. The day that I go down there, I meet Daryl Lockhart. If there's no Daryl Lockhart, there's no Fat Man Scoop. Daryl Lockhart used to be a promo rep at chemistry. He looks at me, he says, yo, the Diamond D says, you're, you're okay, you're okay. And it was uh, it was me, um, a guy named uh, J.C. Was J.C. Hairston there? No, no. Did J.C. work with you? Who? J.C. Hairston. No. Who was pro? Who who was promo on the Biggie tape that I did? I forget. I get the name later, but anything. I think it was J.C. Heston. Was, that was the A and R. They had a bunch of A and R. They had a bunch of interns that were coming in. Okay, so you so went in as an intern. You went in. Yeah, I went in as an intern. I went to this. There was a bunch of. There was maybe about seven or eight interns that were coming in at that time. The A and R. The main A and R at Chemistry's name was Brian Chen. And they had a and interns, they had promo interns, about eight of us. And I went in there 
And I could see that every other person was in there. They were on the phone talking to chicks. And, Yo, I'm working here and I'm doing this and bullshitting and, you know, what, whatever they fucking playing games and whatever. But I went in with the eye of the tiger because I had a kid coming. And I had to save my family's life. And that was my shit. So I was on a whole different fucking level. And uh, um, Dow Lockhart said, yo, I got a pile of CDs. And what they did was back in the day, CDs used to have the plastic cover on it. Remember? Yep. They had, they had made 27,000 CDs for a group named Poison Posse, who was Sweet T's group. But they had fucked up and put the wrong lettering. I put the wrong message on He said, yo, man, it was 27. It was like fucking like 200 boxes of that shit. Well, maybe more. He said, yo, you got to go in there, cut the plastic off and put the right, we got the, we got the, 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 the stickers. You got to put the new sticker on. And it took me about a week and a half, but I did all 27,000 of them. And when I finished, I said, well, what else do you have for me? He said, you will go sweep the floor. I'll sweep the floor, sweep it the best way I can. So what else you got for me? You'll go wash the windows. And this went on for about two or three weeks for maybe, maybe a month. Like, what do you need to do? Yo, I would come down there every day and arrange pencils, dumb shit, like just stupid Mr. Miyagi, wax on, wax off shit. Meanwhile, all these dudes are still on the phone playing games, sending out records to their girlfriend, all kind of shit. One day he said, yo, man, I'm not using this. Here's this list. It's the C list of college radio. You know, the stations, nobody fucking with you, nobody paying attention. He said, call these people and let them know that we got NOG and the Bulldogs coming. Be a father to your child or whatever the fuck it was. I called that list. I started getting busy. And now I'm, you know, I'm doing my thing with the C list. So he says, yo, man, shit, you do your thing with the C list. Now keep in mind, I'm getting off at, I'm going to work at, I'm, I'm, I'm going to work at 7 a.m. I'm working from 7 to 2. I'm taking a shower at my job from 2 to 2.15 in the fucking upstairs in the third floor in the delivery room, and I'm going down, I'm rushing on the, on the train, I'm going down to Chemistry Records, I'm working there from 3 to 11, and then I'm getting on the, the express bus to be back on Gun Hill Road at like 12, 15, and I sleep, I get in the bed 12, I get in the house 12, 12, 20, I take a shower 12, 30, 12, 45, I sleep from 12, 45 to 5, 5, 15 the next morning. I do that for a year and a half. So he says, yo, Take my B list. Fuck it. Just take my B dudes. I'll focus on, you know, the big guys and shit, right? The big guys in college radio, right? Like DJ Riz and all these motherfuckers, right? I, I start killing the B list. I'm killing the B list. He's like, okay, just, just, you my, you my lieutenant. You my lieutenant. So now he handling all the A people. I'm handling the Bs and Cs. All the records are getting played now. We kill it. So now this is, this goes on for about a year and a half. One day I get a call from a guy named Albi Ragusa at Tommy Boy Records, right? Many days I want to quit, but I'm like, no, no, just keep going on, man. Something's going to come at the end. One day I get a call from Albi Ragusa at Tommy Boy Records. He says, hey, man, uh, this is Albi Ragusa. Now, I know who Albi Ragusa is because Tommy Boy Records is the shit. So he's the man who's designing all the back covers of the source. And people, the source magazine today would be Getting your getting your video or your your song placed on World Star, all hip hop, XXL, it would be like the equivalent of just whatever the biggest shit is in terms of reach. A ball alert, a, a, a fucking a shit. It would be all of those shits put in the one, right? Would, would you agree with that? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. So he calls me, and I'm like, oh my god, I'll be. He calls Chemistry Records. He's like, I'm looking for school. He said, Who is it? I'll be Ragusa from Tommy Boy. And they said, Albi Ragusa from Tommy Boy is on the phone for you. But nobody pays attention. I pick up the phone. I'm like, hey, hey, uh, Albi, how you doing? He said, listen, man, I want to offer you a job at Tommy Boy Records and rap promotion. I want you to run the rap department. I said, you, you, you want me to run? run, run? Because I'm stuttering now. I'm like, you want me to run the rap, the rap, rap, rap department? And he said, yeah, I want you to run the rap department. I'll, I'll, you know, Naughty by Nature, House of Pain, De La Soul, yes. Okay, see you later. Be safe. Um, you know, House of Pain, Naughty by Nature, De La Soul, you know those guys? You ever heard of those guys? Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
you know, why, why, why do you want to, why are you picking me? He said, because I got on the phone and I spoke to every DJ and I asked them the three people that they, sp- they spoke to last. Every time I spoke to all these DJs, they all said your name. Incredible. G- 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 I, I want to interject before we move this on because you, you're dropping so much good stuff, Scoop. How long, by the time you got that call from Tommy Boy Records, you were working at Chemistry for a year, year and a half? Year and a half, man. And there were Going many hard. days. Going hard. Many days. Fuck this, man. No, I'm tired. No, I don't want to do this, man. I was on the fucking, you know, I would, I would be on the express bus on the way home from Mount Sinai Hospital. I mean, from 23rd, 23rd Street Chemistry Records, sleep on the bus and get to the fucking end of the thing and I'm still sleeping the bus, man. He just got to the point where at the end he would just wake me up. So, so let me ask you something, school. Did you ever get an official job while you were at chemistry? Or, did, or was that interning the whole way? I was interning the whole way. Okay. For anybody who is listening, anybody who is watching, I talk about trust in the process all the time. But you staying committed, you going, the, the, the fact that, and you said it multiple times, you had a full-time job, a full-time job that was paying your bills, 7, in, 7 a.m. to 2 p.m. You leave your full time job and take my I don't I don't eat. I take my lunch. And I use my lunch to take a shower and go down there. It, but that level of commitment, that level, that level of dedication, if you want success, if you're trying to reach your goals, if you're trying to do something that you have no idea how you're gonna get it, first, you gotta put in the work. And you are a classic example of putting in the work and understanding that there is more than eight hours in a day. So many people, they sit and they give themselves every excuse on planet Earth for why they're not achieving their dreams, for why they can't do what it is that they say they want to do. Their mouth says, I want to do it, but I'm tired. But I have a full-time job. You you, you working two full-time jobs and not getting paid for one of them. So I love that, but what I really love about what you just told us you, 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 for a year and a half, you work for free, interning. But in that year and a half, you were building up your presence in the industry. The, the rest of the world didn't know that you weren't getting paid. When you got that call from Tommy Boy, they didn't know you weren't getting paid. They're they just looking at it. Like he's doing his thing and we need him over here. So yeah. when you think people are not watching you, go hard. When yeah. you think Nobody is noticing your effort. Go harder. Yep. You do not see light at the end of that tunnel. You keep moving forward. I love mm-hmm. that in, in, in terms of how you finally was able to penetrate this industry and then go into Tommy Boy for anybody who doesn't realize, look at the names that you just said. <laughs> you, know, you, you, you got Naughty by Nature. You got House of a- Like these are... Triple, quadruple platinum artists. Remember, it wasn't the bad boy era yet. Exactly. exactly. They were still dominating. Hard. Hard. So I'm gonna give, I'm gonna be a little extra when I do this, but I'm gonna give you guys a good example of what I'm saying here. This is what happened. I'm gonna show you what happened real quick. Scoop, you do realize you're on, a, on an interview, correct? I got, it. I got it. Go ahead. This right here is what I was doing. No lights, nobody cheering, nobody saying keep going, nobody saying, yo, man, you the shit. Nobody saying, yo, you want to be on the cover of the Source magazine. Oh, shit, you're going you gonna to change this industry. And I did change this industry in a way. I, I switched the game completely. For anybody who don't know what I did at Tommy Boy, I changed the game. Nobody will ever do that the way I did it, period. Comma, exclamation point. Except for maybe Jay Black from Bad Boy with you. But he did it in a different way, different era. Um, it's 
it's it's it's when nobody when no lights are on, no cheering, nobody saying yo, get up at five fifteen and go to work, right? So now I'm here. But when Aldi Ragusa call me, this what happened. This will happen real quick. Boom. Now you got Fat Man Scoop right here. Now the lights are on. Now everybody's watching. Now they're like, yo, who the fuck is this new kid that they got a Tommy Boy? This Tommy Boy's a powerhouse. Where the fuck did he come from? So, okay. And I said, y'all want to know where the fuck I came from? I'm about to show you motherfuckers. And I proceeded to show motherfuckers exactly who I was and what I was. Now, I made $18,500 a year working at Mount Sinai Hospital. And thank the Lord that my godmother, Emma, I thank her every day, got me that job. The day I got time, hired a Tommy Boy, I made $202,000 a year. You went from eighteen five. 202. To 202. You tell me God ain't good. And it, it, it is the work. Me, it's the work. But you put in the work. And you believed in you. It and you understood God. if I keep grinding, if I keep moving forward, persistence always come, overcomes resistance. Definitely, definitely, man. Definitely. And, and you know something? There were many times on that bus that I was fucking crying. I would be going home crying like, yo, man, when's this shit going to stop? You know, when's somebody going to call me? And, and sometimes even what, what I'm doing now with this Instagram Live series, I got to think about that. I'm like, yo, when is my number going to get called? Yo, man, fuck that, man. Keep, keep mashing. So now I go into Tommy Boy Records, and now I'm doing my thing. Right? So now I got an official flag. Now I got a flag now. So now what I'm calling people, I ain't calling motherfuckers as an intern from Tommy, I, I, from chemistry. I'm calling them from a fucking real seat. So now I'm doing my thing. I'm doing my thing. And Monica Lynch and Tom Silverman, who again, no Monica Lynch, no Tom Silverman, no Fat Man School, they realize, you know, I'm, I got an infectious personality. I'm in there making motherfuckers laugh. I got my own lingo. I'm doing my own shit. They like, yo, man, take this fucking guy and put him on the back of the sauce. Again, I can't explain it. It's ball alert, world it's star. Shade, it's shade room. It's shade it's room. Having your record streamed a million times on Spotify. Bill, and no, no, let's see, let's see, 600 million times. There you go. So, <laughs> so that's, what, that's what being on the back of the sauce. And I'm going to tell you something. Cause I remember, cause I was young and I was coming up in the game. And I remember seeing you on the back of the sword because that that's, you got a very unique look. That's I wasn't a fucking artist. I wasn't an artist. An artist. It, took, it took your stock from, from people knowing your name in the industry to now we see the face. This guy is a, is, a, is, a, is a bona fide star. Just being on the back of the source at that time. Yeah, yeah definitely. Absolutely. Definitely. I mean, you, you really did change the culture of, I remember DDOT, for anybody who doesn't know, Derek Angeletti, the mad rapper. And I was talking to him one day. And he was like, you, you know, he would always, and I got to give it to him because guys like him, you know, it, it would be no prez with, with, without those guys. And, you know, he was telling me, Prez, you're doing your thing. And every time he would talk to me, he would be like, Prez, what up? And I'd be like, yo, I'm good. I'm quiet. And he pulled me to the side one day and he said, don't ever say that again. He was like, don't be quiet, be a riot. That was his exact words. How can you promote an artist if you're not willing to promote yourself? Mm -hmm. And I had never, you know, me being a promo person like yourself, you set the bar. There had never been a celebrity promo per that I know of. There, there were people with big names in the industry, but you were a bona fide celebrity Talk. as a promo person. So every Talk. DJ, every programmer was taking your call. 
they were just taking the fucking call, man. And Tom Silverman and Monica Lynch had so much, they had so much fucking uh, 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 foresight with that. And I just went from, you know, fat man scoopers or the fat man scoopers on the fucking line. And, you know, God bless the dead, DJ Law and fucking in fucking uh, Norfolk, Virginia, or yep. DBS, or in, in Raleigh, North Carolina, or, or you know, uh, Big Boy and Fuzzy in LA, or who, whoever I was calling, the motherfucker from the source is on the phone. There you go. Get at him. So. Yeah, because you were like the official, the unofficial mascot of Tommy Boy Records at that time. So, 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 so now here's the next part. Now you, you, you saw it. So now they got to be Valley's now. So now, it starts off as a joke. Oh, that motherfucker's the mascot of Tommy Boy. He's a clown, this, that. You guys go ahead and laugh. I'm going to get on the back of this fucking magazine. And I did the fucking thing with the, um, where I was playing basketball. Then I did one where I was playing golf. And then I did one where I was just on the back of the thing. I, I think I did four of them. And they laughed, and then the laugh became hate. See, because now you're fucking killing. So now first you were laughing at me. But now you understand that I'm the immovable object in this motherfucker. Then you start realizing that I'm going into meetings, and they say, hey, Scoop, what do you think? Now you motherfuckers that laughed at me, y'all are y'all are the unknown names in the, in here. So now it's hate. There you go. Okay. Now with hate comes people's bullshit. So something that happened that took place, I almost got fired because somebody kind of said something. I, I I was out on the road with with Tretch from Naughty by Nature. I was out on the road with Naughty by Nature, and I something that happened. We were in Houston. And Naughty by Nature, they didn't give a fuck about Tommy Boy. They, they were angry as fuck. And they were just going off. And I happened to be in the room. And he said, Scoop, ain't that right? I said, yeah, that is right, man. Boom, 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 boom. So somebody there took it and ran with it. And it got to the attention of Tom Silverman, who was the head of owner of Tommy Boy. So he came, in, he, you know, I came into the office. I came back from Houston. And motherfuckers was looking at me like I was a ghost. I said, oh <laughs> shit, man, this is this is this, this is crazy. So I go in my room and I'm, my man is in there. Um, my man Brian, who used to do publicity, I shared the room with him. And I was like, yo, man, what the fuck is going on? He's like, yo, man, these motherfuckers was blah 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 stirring up some shit, and that got to Tom Silver. So he's gonna fire you today. So. My heart dropped because, you know, I, I think I'm the fucking man over here. Humbling moment. I call up Tresh. Back then, it's the Motorola flip phones and because I, I had Tresh number. Nobody, Tommy Boy had Tresh number because he didn't fuck with nobody. Tresh was the nigga who was throwing rats and all that. He was, you know, back then, he was terrorizing the label, throwing rats in there, like you smacking motherfuckers up, all kinds of shit, smacking up employees, all kinds of shit. I called Tresh and I'm like, yo, yo, uh, yo, um, old boy, because you know, they call him, anybody who knows Trish call him old boy. They yo, old boy, listen, man, it's been real working with you, my nigga. I love you. I just want to say thank you for the opportunity because you, yo, man, y'all took me to places I probably never would go. So I love you, man. I appreciate working with you. And I'm going to take this Tommy Boy shit and I'm going you know, I'm to a, I'm a remember this shit for the rest of my life. He said, what? I said, he said, what the fuck you talking about? So yo, man, because I agree with y'all in Houston, they're going to fire me. He said, sit in your seat, don't move, give me five minutes. So we used to have, before email, there used to be a thing in everybody's, Tommy Boy was light years ahead of everybody with technology and everything. There used to be a thing in, on everybody's desk, and it was like, you, you could talk to people amongst the office. So it would be like, you, if I want to talk to Sean Perez, you were SP. So I would just type in SP it was before email. This yep. was like some other shit. It was like, you could type in some shit and hit it to SP and it'd be like, yo, man, come over to my office and holler at me. So nobody had to walk back and forth. And this was on three or four floors with an amazing system. And it's like, so I got a thing from TS, which was Tom Silverman. Bing! 
T.S., come to my office now. I said, okay, this is it, man. I'm gone. I get to the office, and Tom Silverman says to me, he's like, listen, man, I just got a rare call from Tretch. He said, if we fight, he's going to bring all of downtown Newark down here to fuck everybody in this office up and throw rats and do crazy shit. <laughs> He said, I don't get calls. Tretch never calls here. For him to call this office and with that threat, obviously they love you. So here's the deal. You're now in charge of Tommy Boy Record. I mean, you're, you're now in charge of Naughty by Nature. If we need anything from Naughty by Nature, we call you. If we need to negotiate something with them, you go and negotiate. If we need to do X, Y, we need Tretch to go MTV Music Awards, you go get them, you take them, you bring them back. No one at this label will deal with Tretch other than you. Here's a bonus. And wrote me a check. Excuse me? Here's a bonus, bro. You went from getting fired to a bonus. To a bonus in the same day. At the same time. How much was I the walked check? in the door how thinking I was going to get fired. He how said, How much was the check? Uh, uh, good. Six figures. Excuse me? Yeah, it was, good. it was a good check. Good check. So, so it went from, but you got to remember back then, it was only sales of CDs and vinyl. Motherfuckers were making money hand over no, foot. I, 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 to I no understand, money. but again, it, it, it just. It just overemphasizes some of the key things I want to pull from your story. Number one, yeah. trust the process. You got to trust that, the process. You, Prez, you, that's, I, I don't mean to cut you off, Prez, but, but that's why if Naughty asks me to do anything, I'm always there for Naughty. If, if old boy asks me to come do something, other than gunning nigga now, I'm there. What, what, oh boy, where you need trust? Where you need me to be, bro? What what I need to do? End of story. I, there's no there's no conversation. There's no discussion. No nothing. You ask him about that, he'll tell you. He called him. But look, look, look. he goes. He leave this. You he leave this label. I'm bringing three hundred niggas from L Town down here. We throwing rats and we fucking everybody up down. <laughs> I went back to my room floored. I was floored. I, I didn't, he said, yo, he said, Trench doesn't call up here. He doesn't speak to us. If we have to speak to him, we speak to him through Shaquem or Latifah. For him to call here and say that and then hang up, from now on, the, the Naughty by Nature account is all you. Yeah, Videos, but... treatments, you, the people talk to you and then you talk to Trench. I just don't think people, you know, and, and just in the interest of time, Scoop, we, we're going to move the interview forward. Yeah, but that, 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 that's, the, that's, the, that's the overall with it, man. Like, No, 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 no. That's not the overall. And it's something that I did. What God got for you. It's for you, bro. You can't take from you. No, can't, 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 can't take it from you. No, what God got for this, this was ordained for you, this path that you was on. You weren't no, I didn't know. But God had it for you. And didn't know. It, it, you, nobody, you know, when, when he, and I just need people to understand that because you sometimes you, you look at the obstacles in front of you. In your case, you were looking at being fired, terminated. Terminated. What God got for you. Don't, don't, you, it's yours. You ain't got to worry about no external no. forces working against you. You don't have to worry about anything that is in front of you that, that, would to the to to the to the eye would make you think oh, I see a door closed. It's no way I'm gonna be able to get to the other side. Don't worry about that. Trust in God. Yeah, it, it yeah. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm I, I want to go through this. This is the first time I told the whole thing in detail because this is the kind of show that people need to hear the process. Yes. So quickly, so quickly, so boom, I do that. I'm you know yeah, it's cool, everything good. I now am overweight. I'm making phone calls all day. I'm going through stress, whatever, right? I happen to be another way of putting in work because I had so I had been 
used to sleeping three or four hours a day for so long that I never really slept. I worked in the morning. I, I got up in the morning. I was at Tommy Boy at seven o'clock in the morning. I would I would work the whole day and then call the West Coast at night and then go to the club and hand out records and I would take a cab home, cab service. And and one day they tried to embarrass me in in the meeting and like the the you know the the, the big meeting. They were like, um, "This is the cab service budget." This is how much everybody else uses, like that little slim, slim thing, thing. And then this is the rest of the pie is what Fat Man Scoop uses. And I said, well, I said, okay, okay, well, who opens this building? Who, you got the ADT, who opens the building? Me, by 7 o'clock. Who closes 7 a.m.? Who closes the building at 11, 30, 12 o'clock? Me. Who goes to the who goes to the club after that gives out records and sees the DJ? Me. And who's up at 6, 5.30, 6 a.m. in the morning at the morning show with Ed Love and Dr. Dre on the on, talking to them, giving them records before he come here? Me. Then they turned around and that's when they thought they said, you know something? That was the beginning of rap dance with Renee McClain. They were like, yo, fuck that, we're gonna give you a rap dance. But I never got it because I left. I went to Hot 97. So the story behind that is every morning I used I was up early. I was always working. I would go to Hot 97 in the, to the to the morning show. I love and Dr. Dre. And if you remember Hot 97 back then, it was a big metal door, and you couldn't get through that door. It was like a waiting area, and then the big ass metal door, and you couldn't get through the door. So I would just get into that first room, and then I would just sit there. And so, you know, Ed Love and Dr. Dre or, or DJ Scribble or somebody decided to, you know, come and say hello to me. And I'd be like, yo, man, blah, 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 I'm just here to play this record or whatever. And that was that. Then every morning I would start seeing people coming through. And I just start talking to them. And then one morning, I, you know, I know somebody, I'm like, here's some coffee, man. I brought some coffee for you. And then, I, you know, I, I would get to know all the people coming in through the door. Then eventually the motherfucker started letting me in on my own. Like I would come in with somebody that I knew that I got cool with, and I would now I wouldn't even I would bypass that shit. I would just walk through the door and, and I would walk into the studio. And they'd be like, how the fuck you get in here? <laughs> no, I'm just, you know, so I'm doing that more and more and more. And now at loving Dr. Dre, they like my lingo, they like the way I'm talking, they start putting me on the on the show as a character. So now I'm on the fucking show. Now I'm the promoter with on Tommy Boy who's on the fucking show talking on the only morning show, hip hop morning show in, in America. So now I'm talking, now I'm the Batman school, yo, get at me, bro, right on, dynamite and all that shit, right? So eventually Steve Smith, who's the program director, comes to me. This is like five or six months into this. He said, yo, man, why don't you just go in here and say Hot 97, Blazing Hip Hop, read these things on the paper for me. And just, you're going to go in there with the guy and read the shit on the paper with him. I said, okay, cool. No problem. So I said, Hot 97, blazing hip-hop and r and I don't even know I got this voice. I'm just doing shit. So, you know, I do that shit, and now they got my voice on the station. Now I'm the voice of the station now. So now you do that shit for another two months. Steve Smith come to me one morning when I'm up there. He come up at like 7 or 8 o'clock in the morning because I'm up there early. He come and he say, yo, listen, man. You have somehow figured out how to get in the station. <laughs> you figured out how to fucking infiltrate the station, and now you're on the fucking station. He said, listen, I got a job in overnights. Angie Martinez is moving to the daytime. You think you want to take the job? I said, yo, fuck it, I'll take the job. I even asked him how much the money was. Because promotion, you know, is stress, and you selling shit that you might not like, and you know, a bunch of shit. I was like, yo, I'll take it. I left Tommy Boy, I went to Hot 97. So I'm doing my thing at Hot 97. I'm the overnight guy, boom, 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 boom. My brother wants to go to Hampton University. My family got money, but they ain't got, they got $50,000 a year money. So I'm like, okay, well, what can we do? Fuck, what, what can I do to help my, my little brother get money? I said, wait a hold on. I hear DJ Cool doing Let Me Clear My Throat. So I'm like, yo, man, fuck, I could do that. That's crowd participation. I go and make a record like DJ Cool, but it's the worst fucking record ever because that's not my lane. I'm coming. I'm driving into the station one night, listening to Flex because I'm on. I'm on after Flex. Flex is seven to twelve. I'm twelve to five. So I hear the song is New York in the house right now. That uh, DJ Scissor Hands, Crook McClan, DJ Liz, Crook McClan. I'm like, yo, this shit is hot. So I so I go to Flex and I say, yo, who is that? Who's who's DJ Liz? He said, oh, that's DJ Liz from Wildman Steven DJ Liz, the guys I used to promote. 
back in the days when I was an intern and when I was in hot Tommy Boy. So I said, I call up DJ Riz and I'm like, yo, Riz, I need you to make me a record just like that. He said, yo, come tomorrow. So it's him and DJ Scissorhands with a Crooklyn clan. Um, so they say, you know, we, we, we in front of a church in front of fucking a church in Canarsie, Brooklyn. They like, yo, man, um, just yell something. I was like, well, what do you want me to yell? So said, well, yell hands up. And I was like, okay, hands up. And scissor hands jumps up in the fucking air and he goes crazy. He said, we got our own sampling machine. Next day we do, we go do hands up. We, we press it up. We put it on 88 records. We press it up because that's their record label. We boom. So now I take it to Hot 97. I give Funkmaster Flex the acetate. Because back then it was the acetate. The original, I wish I would have fucking kept that acetate. But I gave it to him, and he never said nothing. Never said nothing. I gave him, I said, yo, Flex, this is a record I'm doing to kind of put my brother Kendall through school. He knew Kendall, because when you do, rec- when you do record promotion, you got to learn people's lives. You know people's right. family, you know people's friends, because you're talking to people to get your records played. So he said, okay, cool. Um, Two days later, it's going, where, 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 where my niggas is at? And now Flex is playing that shit, right? I ain't playing it once. He stopped he playing it again. I'm like, oh shit, this shit's crazy. So I get, a, I, I now get the vinyl and I put the vinyl in the, in the, in the air studio. That's where all the DJs go. I put the vinyl in there, it's gone. Put the vinyl in there, it's gone again, and, and that's it. That, they, they're playing all, they're playing hands up. Cause now I'm telling them, Yo, remember my brother Kendall? I'm trying to get him to go to college. So Cosmic Kev, DJ Law, Mike Street, or I, 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 all these DJs from across America because I know them and they know my family. They like, yo, you doing you, you doing a record to put Kendall through school? I'm like, yeah. They like, yo, man, send me the record. We gonna play. We gonna show you some love. I'm like, yo, man, if I could get a hundred shows at five hundred dollars a piece, I make the fifty thousand to do it. Cosmic Cab, um, DJ, all these motherfuckers call me back. Yo, that record is fire. They start playing this shit crazy. Playing it more, playing it more. And I get my brother through college. Put my brother through college. He comes out, he, he works with me. This is five or six years later. He works with me. He's my intern. He's my, my, my hype man on stage. He's doing all that shit. Next thing you know, he said, yo, I want to do, do my own thing. I want to be my own man. All right, fuck it. I put him, in, put him in an internship. He does one internship. He leaves that, does another one. Again, for free, do that. Does another internship, winds up at Dev Jam <clears throat> with Theo. TVT with Theo, Dev Jam with Theo. Winds up, meets another kid named Steve Carlos. They become this group called the Best of Both Offices. Young Sav and Steve Carlos. They do their thing. Uh, what, uh, uh, he winds up meeting a new up and coming artist through Dev Jam called Rick Ross. He gets a real good relationship with Rick Ross. Rick Ross says, Yo, listen. I want you to leave Dev Jam and be the president of Maybach Music. He leaves, Steve Carlos, he goes and he's the president of, of CTE Young Jeezy. Boom. My brother turns around, he's an executive, he got his own group, he got his own people he, uh, he fucking does, he manages Flip De Niro, he's part of Khaled's inner circle and advisement team and all that shit like that, and there you go, man. So that's, in a nutshell, the story. So incredible story. <laughs> Kendall, that's his that's his gold record. Um, that's my gold record. That Rick Ross is Kendall. That Rick Ross there is Kendall, and that Kanye is Kendall. This is my lecture. This is my big L. So I put my brother's stuff up here because I helped my brother, and then my brother helped me, and I helped my brother. So any of his accomplishments are my fucking accomplishments, and any of my fucking accomplishments are his fucking accomplishments. No, there's no question. And shout shout to your brother, Young Sav. You know, he has done amazing things in this industry as well. So I I love your story about how you was able to help. You know, this is, obviously he's blood, right? But you didn't give him a handout. You gave him a hand up. And he did the work again. He did the work. fucking work again. I need, to, I need you to understand something because it's, it's, it's a great point. When you were trying to get him through school, you come up with this plan of making a record which will ultimately change your life. Mm-hmm. All of those DJs that you befriended for so many years, they didn't give you a handout. They gave you the hand up. Yep. And it changed you. So now you go from promo man, radio guy, radio, to now you are, are, it all comes back full circle. 
You're an artist. Where you started out me. as a teenager, and, and you're doing it your way this time. Yep. Incredible. So, but, but hold on, Sean. Had I done that shit back then, I might have died. Because it wasn't me. No. Because, because the, 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 that might have wound up in my death. I also wasn't being myself. This go round, I'm myself. I get it done my way now. Hold on now. Because I, I wound up, the reason those records took off is because I did that for not my own purpose, but, but to put my brother through school, which was a bigger purpose. Yes. Those records took off. Boom, we're out of here. Now, God gives me 25 years or more of saying, you know, so we did something to take care of your family. Boom, boom, boom. Here you go. Be faithful, sir. Here you go. Uh, lose control, sir. Here, drop. Here you go. Take that. Uh, Mariah Carey, take that. Sean Paul, take that. It's just boom, 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 boom. So it was at, at one point I was just on, I was just going in and seeing. And now I'm at a place where my voice is so recognizable, I can say dog shit, dog shit, and people will dance. <laughs> so I mean, but that's God's work, man. That ain't me. I was placed in the right position because I did the right fucking thing. But what I didn't know was back then, God was creating a path to make me 40 times more powerful because now I know the fucking DJs. I know them. They my people. They fuck with me. Whereas if you are new and upcoming artists, you don't know the DJs. You don't know nobody. And they're not playing your shit. They don't know you. And yeah, you can have the internet now and do your thing, but you're not, you can't get on the phone and call Flex. Yeah, because you were in a unique position where you established relationships with DJs all over the country. And when you, and became, world, an artist, world, when world. you became an artist, you could work your own records. Like, like, it, Sean, I was dangerous, man. Again, me, what God got me. for you, what God got for you, just trust the process and put it in the I, I can't say that, no, like, I didn't realize that this is the direction that our interview was gonna go, but it's so good because you, you just, you're bringing up so many great points that people yep. really need to understand because everybody, right? People think whatever they're gonna do, sometimes it doesn't happen for a year. For a year. Five years down the road. But if you can just believe, and if you can just think and understand, you know, it's this quote by Jack Canfield that I love and I speak about it all the time on my show. You're not given a dream if you don't have the capacity to fulfill it. And what mm -hmm. that means is when God gives you the dream, you, it's yours. It ain't mine. But if he gives you the dream and you put in the work, it's nothing that nobody can do to stop you. Now, it might not come overnight, but if you stay on the path of your dream and your purpose, eventually, even if you don't understand why am I on this path, because you could not have understood. It's impossible to think that, look, me working alongside these DJs and taking care of them and befriending them for so many years, one day I'm gonna make a record. And all of that is gonna come to my benefit. Yo, bro, I pushed the button like this. Me and Chris LaMonica, who used to work for Loud Records, we got in the car and we drove from Boston, from DJ Pup all the way down to I wrote Connecticut, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York, Philadelphia, uh, Baltimore, with, 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 uh, with uh, what's the fucking Claxton and, and, and DJ CeeLo and DC all the way down Mike Street, DJ Law, DVS. We went all the way down from Boston to the fucking Carolinas, man. And we gave that record out. We fucking kissed babies. We fucking, I was so tired of seeing green signs, exit signs. I don't know <laughs> what to do after that fucking weekend. But we did it. That shit took off and, and then that, it just led to one thing and the next thing and then and and and, and 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 it was gone and that's actually to, to to wrap up the story that is why you have to kind of it anything that's worth having is gonna hurt you know anything that's worth money is gonna hurt if you if it's easy you know anybody could go flip burgers at mcdonald's that shit is easy so you don't get paid a lot for that but it's also how you handle that experience. So you go into McDonald's and you flip the burgers like, 
man, fuck this shit. When I get, I'm gonna get off the fucking six thirty. I'm gonna go mess with some chick. If you flip it with that, then yeah, you going you you're not gonna make no money. But if you go in the McDonald's and you say to yourself, wait up, I'm a I'm a, I'm a minority. Um, there's certain things that happen in McDonald's I could probably take advantage of. Fuck it, let me go in here and let me learn the fries. And let me learn this. And let me learn this. And you know something? Let me go get close to the manager and let me learn how the back end work. And let me work, learn how to do this. Now, people want, because they got a stupid ass, dumb mentality, go call you an ass kiss or a brown noser. No, motherfucker, I'm, I'm working to get, eventually own one of these because I work here. McDonald's gives preferential treatment and money to people who work here because they know you know how to run the business. There you go. Okay, now, I got that. We'll go get some money with some investors and then we'll go do our thing. I've seen people do it before. It's all in how you approach what you do. Whew. Scoop, before we wrap this thing up, you, what I love about your career is you have transitioned multiple times. You're a promo person, you're an artist. You're a radio host, two-time Grammy Award winner. And now you're doing it again. So much of the world has changed because of COVID. So mm -hmm. much of, of what we knew to be norm, to be the status quo, to be how we earned a living, it's been flipped upside down. And so okay. many people are transitioning. I'm watching you transition, and I love what you're doing with your interviews and your IG lives and the way that you are, are having these candid conversations with your guests. Can you just speak to someone out there who maybe they don't believe in themselves. Maybe they don't understand that they could be great doing something else, something that they really want to do, but maybe they're not known for it. You, you, know, you are known obviously for making some of the greatest party records of all time. You work yeah. with, with Missy Elliott, you work with uh, Mariah Carey, Faith Ever, just so many. But this is a new endeavor for you. But people are always afraid of change. Can you talk to anybody out there who wants well, to make that leap of faith, but they're just afraid? I, I, I'm, I'm gonna tell you this. I, when I, when I tell you that I travel the world, I get on a plane like people get on the BX-11 bus. Whatever the bus is in your city that goes from the east side to the west side or wherever it goes, I get on planes like people get on buses. At the airlines, I know every flight attendant, especially on the routes that I go, New York to London. I know everybody. I know the fucking pilots. Like, that's how much work that, that's how much I do this. I travel to over a hundred countries a year. The only countries I haven't been to is Mexico and like maybe like Guam or some shit. Like in Guam is a man. Oh, you, you, did you just say you haven't been to Mexico? I haven't been to Mexico. All of these exotic countries that you've been to, you've never been to Cancun. You've I've been never been to Cancun. I've never been to Colombia. I've never been to, um, I went to Belize one time. I went to Brazil. Okay, um, just, just finish your story like, in the interest of time. Just, just finish this story. I, I, I'm shocked by that. And anyway, um, to, to, to say what I was saying, I, I now am in this position where my entire life is cut down. And there's a level of fear there because I make a lot of money. I do okay. But now I go from thousands and thousands a month to zero. So when I get, I come back from England, when, when they, they do the repatriation flights, you got to come back home. You got to come back to America. And I'm in my, in, I'm in my bed in, on March 8th, March 11th or March 12th or something. And I'm, I said, you know something I've been running for 20 years, every week, 49 weeks a year for 24 years. I'm going to take a three day rest. I rest for three days. Then I get up and I say, okay, well, what now? I said, I got to do something and I got to change the game. I said, I do radio. I said, I always wanted to have my own morning show. I said, when I had a morning show, I had a morning show with Miss Jones, but it didn't work because I didn't have the guts to stand up to management and tell them what the fuck I really need to do. I did it their way. And because of that, it fucking failed. 
Okay. That's why Star and Buck Wild worked because they went in there. It's different when you when you work for somebody and you're used to getting a check every week, you have a different level of fear because you don't want to ruffle the feathers because you don't want to get fired. Star and Buck Wild had no, they were they were they do what like we do. They were entrepreneurs, they're coming from the street. So they had no problem saying, listen, if you don't want me to do this the way I'm gonna do it, man, fuck you and get me the fuck out of here. I didn't have that kind of level of you know, of, of, of guts to do that because I was used to getting the check. Huh? Of confidence in yourself. I didn't have a confidence in myself to say, listen, this is the way we're going to do it. All the shit that they were doing in the morning, cursing on our show, I was doing that shit at night. But but I let somebody talk me out of the plan that I should have done. However, um, I said, okay, well, what can I do? I said, well, the only thing that's available right now is Instagram Live. I said, fuck it, let me go on and do Instagram Live. I had just put up a a backdrop the week before, because I said, when I come back, I'm going to start playing with the Instagram Live. It was there, boom, I got on, start doing it, start doing it, start doing it. I'm, I'm grabbing everybody I can, DMX, Missy Elliott, boom, 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 boom. I'm amazingly hot, right? Then I have a dip, because you now run out of almost people to interview. There's, you know, there's maybe a few people that I haven't interviewed. Jamie Foxx, the people I haven't interviewed is Jamie Foxx, Shaq, Kevin Hart, and that's it. Like, you know, and those are three people, biggest people that I haven't interviewed yet. But you run into uh, a, a law where everybody who's wanted to be interviewed has been interviewed, right? All right, cool. So what you going to do now? You can't go with the celebrity factor. You got to switch it up. You got to get back to your talents, which is making motherfuckers laugh and doing shit like that. So I switched the game. I was just like, yo, I'm going to make my show funny. I'm going to make my show like a morning show. I'm going to talk, talk subjects. I'm going to do my shit. I'm going to do the shit my way. And I'm I'm eight months in, right? So in that eight months, there were three contemporaries of mine. Kenny Burns, Fat Joe, and myself. Those are the three shows that I know that do what we do, right? Mm -hmm. So in that time, Kenny, Kenny Burns got a job on radio in V103. Shout to and Kenny And Fat Burns. Joe, you know, because, huh? Shout to Kenny Burns. Yeah, shout to Kenny Burns. And Fat Joe, because of the superstar he is, you know, he, 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 he can do huge things. He got Puff, Puff Daddy's attention. He got Puff's attention. Boom, he's on Revolve, right? So I'm sitting here and I'm waiting for my moment to get my call. And that moment's not coming. It's just not coming. You know, it's not coming. You know, like, it's not coming. Every day I'm like, it's not coming. It's just not coming. It's not coming. Like, nobody's calling. So I say to myself, one day I have a conversation with myself. And I said, listen, you right back to where you were in 94. Do the fucking work. Don't be concerned about getting the biggest artists. Don't be concerned. If you don't get Jamie Foxx, you don't get him. Just whoever you get and you put in front of you, do the best show you can. Make people laugh as much as you can. Ask the best questions you can. And everything else is going to fix itself. And then I, I had a sudden peace in myself. And that's how I work my show right now. I'm starting to get calls, sponsorship calls. This guy is saying, yo, maybe I give you this, maybe I give you that. And I'm gonna work this motherfucker until I get a morning show. I'm gonna do it one more time. So if y'all think I can do it again, I'm gonna do this shit one more time. And But when I come back, and the thing that I wanna say that's most important, if you have not, and I'll leave you on this note, we had four or five months and we still have time because some people can't go outside. I do clubs. I can't go back to work until May of next year. So I still have time. If you don't walk out of this pandemic having a new skill, having a new, a, a new, a new, a, a, a new skill, uh, having a new job, uh, creating a business, you're a fucking loser. You've had the time to put your work in. Now, in this time, I've, I've worked on this show. I'm trying to create new businesses. God willing, if I do what I need to do, I'm going to come out of this thing with a business, with a radio show, and guess what? I'm going to be Fat Man Scoop. So that means I might make three times the money that I was making back then, but that's because I applied myself. Everybody want the fucking results. You want the Bentley, but you don't want the struggle. You, you can't get the Bentley without the struggle. It's not possible. You, you can't fucking, you can't shortcut the success. Steve Harvey said, 
If you think that you're going to get into something and you're not going to get scraped up, you're not going to get beat up, you're not going to do this, especially big shit, little shit, you can go in the fucking Dollar General and get a fucking job and just get your work like that. Ain't nothing. But you want to you wanna punch that clock at nine, you want to leave at five, and that's it. And that's what we expect of you. But if you want the big shit, you're not, you're not, you're going to have to get hurt, man. You're going to have to get bruised. You're going to get scratched up. You're going to get jerked. You're going to get fucked over. You're going to get whatever. You're going to have to put some work in. But if you are, if you are, if you, you're dedicated to the process, when you make it to the end, you're going to be a bad motherfucker. That's it. The end. I love this. School. I, I could, you know, I, I can't even come behind that because you just dropped so much great stuff. You know, the time is coming. You know, you said it's like big, um, you're back in 94. And that's really what it is. You're back in 94, but you're seeing the results. The sponsorships are coming. I'm watching you from afar. And you have such great content, such great questions, such great guests. And not all of them are, are household names. But meanwhile, I'm watching your IG following go through the roof. Mm-hmm. Uh, for my audience, where can people find you? Okay. You want to um, tap into your, your daily interviews and conversations? Mm-hmm. What's the best way to get at Fat Man Scoop? Oh, well, easy. You can go to our Instagram, at Fat Man Scoop. And uh, if you miss it, you can go to YouTube. I take the the, just the meat, of, meat and potatoes of the interview, and I put it on there. But I want to say something to you. Interviews are cool, and it's great. And you're not going to get... Somebody said something to me. It might have been you. I don't know. It might have been you. No, it was Premium Pete. Premium Pete, the podcaster, used to be down with Combat Jack, said something very important. He said, A-lister or D-lister, you got to put the work in. He said, okay, so if you get Jay-Z this week, right? Mm-hmm. What you gonna do next week? That's right. What you gonna do next week? So if you can't hold your show by yourself, you always gonna be at the mercy of fucking who the person of the day is. That's for right. me, for me, if you come watch my show, I'm very interactive, I deal with the people. I laugh with the people. I have fun. To be honest with you, this show has been a saving grace for me because it's kept me mentally in tune. For those two hours a day or those three hours a day, I'm not thinking about no job or whatever. You know, I'm not thinking about anything that's going on. I'm just thinking about the fun I'm having and interacting with people. I say, listen, if you have time, go to Instagram at Fat Man Scoop. And just watch one of the shows. You'll see people just being themselves. You see the weirdest motherfuckers. You see the funniest people, all, all that kind of stuff. But more importantly, it's about the people. So for me, to be honest with you, I got, have, I mean, I had Dr. Oz on the show. I had Senator, Senator Cory Booker, Candace Owens, fucking uh, Mike Vick, T.I. I had a bunch of different people on the show. But the best, funniest shows that make motherfuckers laugh it's just when it's me and the people. You got, you, you know, that's my thing. It's, I'm for the people. So, uh, Instagram.com slash Fat Man Scoop. And uh, if you miss it, you can catch the replay. Only the interviews at YouTube.com slash Fat Man Scoop. Scoop, we will end it here. You dropped so much incredibly valuable information. I'm sure that anybody who is blessed enough to, to listen to this interview on podcast form or to watch it on YouTube. They're, they're going to be enlightened. Uh, they're going to be inspired. And hopefully it will deliver some gems to them that really just helps them on their journey. You are a true power move maker. And I thank you so much for your time. Peace and blessings, brother. Thank you, bro, man. You know, I appreciate it. You know, I love, you know, we fucking talk on the, we do this shit on, on the telephone, exactly. you know. We just, we just doing this shit uh, for them now. But again, people, I talk to Sean all the time. Same deal. Um, takes time to build anything. You know, he got Funk Master Flex. He had a bunch of different people. There's people who 
I feel should be on there. I haven't been on there yet. She just got to keep working and keep knocking and keep chipping. And the thing that you, that I want, the last thing I want to say is always put your best shit forward. Here's why. You have no idea who is watching you. Senator Cory Booker told me, he was like, yo, man, I was laughing at something that you did. I was like, why the fuck would Senator Cory Booker be watching? Like, you know, why would he be watching? And I, um, a bunch of different celebrities um, have called me and said, yo, man, I, um, you know, you asked me to come on and, you know, I had to go and watch three or four shows. I was laughing. I don't know. Yeah, I'll come on. No problem. You don't know who's watching. And just because it don't say DJ Khaled on there, you could be under another name. They could just hop into your shit under another name. You don't know who's in there. You don't know who's watching. Whatever you do, keep swinging, keep working, and, 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 and understand that every day is your, you're giving out your business card, and I will leave y'all on that note. Man, be safe. Be safe, kid. I love you, and continue blessings and success. Right back at you. My brother. What's up, guys? Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, feel free to share. Peace and love.